In this video, we're going to talk briefly about the concept of price discrimination. Price discrimination occurs when you're able to charge different prices to different customers according to their elasticity of demand. Specifically, you charge high prices to those who have the most inelastic demand because they're willing to buy the product even if the price is relatively high. On the other hand, for those customers who are very sensitive to the price, who have more elastic demand, you charge them lower prices. There are certain conditions required for this to occur. Specifically, a firm cannot do this if the firm is a price taker. If the firm's in a competitive market, it has no control over the price, and therefore it just takes the market prices given, and you can't charge different prices to different customers. So this means that the only firms that can engage in price discrimination are monopoly firms, oligopoly firms, and also firms in monopolistically competitive markets. For this to work, though, firms have to be able to find some rule or some procedure so that they're able to charge higher prices to those with more inelastic demand. And the last condition is that resale must not be feasible, because otherwise you'd have the people who buy the good at a low price purchasing it and then reselling it to those that you try to charge a high price to. Let's talk about some examples in which we see this. This is something that if you think carefully about it, you'll see many examples all around you. One example is airlines. There's two main categories of airline travelers. Some people travel for business purposes, and some people travel for vacation purposes. Business travel usually involves fixed deadlines where you have to be in a certain place at a certain time, and there's not a lot of flexibility about where you go or when you have to go. When people are planning vacations, though, they can plan vacations anywhere, and they generally tend to plan them far in advance. And in general, business travel is paid out of business expenses, and vacation travel is paid out of individuals' own pockets. And perhaps not surprisingly, the demand for business air travel tends to be much more inelastic than the demand for vacation travel. Because if airfares go up significantly to a particular destination, business travelers may still have to go there. But vacation travelers would simply choose to do something else for vacation. They may travel by some other mode of transportation. They may travel to another destination. Or they may just take the time off and engage in local activities. So the demand for business travel is much more inelastic. And the demand for vacation travel is much more elastic. Movie theaters, restaurants, and amusement parks generally offer discounts for children, for senior citizens sometimes for people in the military, and other similar types of specifications. This is done based on the assumption that families with small children, elderly individuals, people in the military, may be more sensitive to price in each of these cases. By using age or employment status, firms are able essentially to charge lower prices to those individuals or those families that have a relatively more elastic demand. Another simple way in which this is done is with those sense-off coupons you may get in the mail, or if you still happen to have Sunday newspapers, that show up in the newspapers as well. And what happens there is people with relatively high incomes generally don't spend a lot of time saving coupons to save 25 cents off of a tube of toothpaste. But if you're struggling to get by and to pay your bills, you're much more likely to be conscious of the price. The people who are most likely to use Sensoff coupons are those in general who are more careful shoppers because they have to be. And as a result, you're essentially charging lower prices to those people who are most sensitive to the price by issuing Sensoff coupons or by issuing rebate coupons. Let's see how price discrimination works in practice. Let's go back to that example of air travel. Here we've illustrated a situation where the demand for business travel is relatively more inelastic at any given quantity than the demand for vacation travel is. And as a result, we end up with a demand curve that's relatively steep for business travel and relatively flat for vacation travel, holding other things constant. We're simplifying here, and instead of an upward sloping marginal cost curve, we're going to assume that the marginal cost of putting one more person on an airline is the same, and it's basically just the cost of the fuel, any food that's offered on the flight, and any other services required to have one more person on the plane. And we're assuming that that's constant, 
at all levels of quantity. For vacation travel, marginal revenue equals marginal costs at a quantity of Q sub V and at a price of P sub V. In the case of business travel, marginal revenue equals marginal costs at a quantity of Q sub V and the price, again, as given by the demand curve is P sub V. And what we observe is that the firm maximizes profits for both groups of customers by charging a higher price for business travel and a lower price for vacation travel. Now, think about how airlines actually do this in practice. One thing we know is that when you travel by air, you can get larger discounts if you make your reservations 30 days or more in advance, and if you include a weekend stay or a longer stay. Both of those restrictions essentially apply only to vacation travelers. And so those super saver fares that airlines tend to give are essentially ways of charging lower prices to vacation travelers while keeping the regular price or the standard price higher for business travelers. And that's just one way in which we observe price discrimination. In the last video on profits in monopoly markets, we talked about how a monopoly firm results in inefficient production and deadweight loss as compared to the competitive market. A monopoly firm charges a higher price than a competitive firm and produces less output, resulting in the deadweight loss illustrated in this diagram. However, there is a way around this, and that is that if a firm engages in perfect price discrimination, it charges each customer the highest price they're willing to pay. Now, in practice, this is really difficult to do, but imagine you could essentially charge each customer the price that is given by the demand curve corresponding to their purchase. So there's someone at the top left who would pay a very high price. The next person would only buy the good if the price is a little lower and so forth. The firm is getting a different price for each customer. And in that case, the marginal revenue from selling one more unit is just equal to the price again. And when that occurs, the equilibrium for a perfectly price discriminating monopolist would be equivalent to the competitive equilibrium. If a firm can engage in perfect price discrimination, deadweight loss is eliminated. However, if you think carefully about it, that only occurs because it's eliminating all of the consumer surplus. Every penny of consumer surplus is converted into producer surplus because each customer would be paying the maximum price they're willing to pay, and that would represent additional revenue and additional profit for firms. So it is an exceptional case. And it's one that in practice is extremely difficult to imagine because the firm must somehow be able to estimate the highest price that individual consumers can pay.